Welcome to episode 80 of Lucretius Today. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with my panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the six books of Lucretius's poem and discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. For anyone who's not familiar with our podcast, please visit EpicureanFriends.com, where you'll find our goals and our ground rules. If you have any questions about those, please be sure to contact us at the forum for more information. In this episode 80, we'll read approximately Latin lines 1226 through 1341 of Book 5, and we'll talk in this episode about the development of the art of war. Now let's join Don reading today's text. And when the raging force of a violent storm upon the sea tosses the admiral of a fleet over the waves with all his elephants and his stout legions about him, does not he fall to praying to the gods for pity? And trembling upon his knees begs a peace of the winds and a prosperous gale in vain, for he is often snatched up by the violence of the hurricane and carried with all his devotion to the Stygian ferry. With such contempt does some hidden power continually trample upon human greatness. It treads with scorn upon the gaudy rods and the cruel axes, those ensigns of power, and makes a sport with them. And then, when the whole earth reels under our feet, and the cities are shaken and tumble about us, or at least threaten to fall, what wonder if men at such a time despise their own weak selves and ascribe infinite power and irresistible force to the gods by which they direct and govern the world? And last of all, brass and gold and iron were discovered, and the value of silver and the weight of lead. For when the whole force upon the high hills were consumed by fire, whether it came by lightning from the heavens or men carried on a war among themselves in the woods and set them in a blaze to terrify their enemies, or whether induced by the goodness of the soil they resolved to enlarge their fruitful fields and make pastures for their cattle, or whether it was to destroy the wild beasts and enrich themselves with their spoils, for the first way of taking the game was by pitfalls and fire before they surrounded the brakes with nets or hunted with dogs. However, it was or whatever was the cause of this raging fire that burnt up the woods to the very roots with frightful noise and set the earth a-boiling with its heat. Then streams of silver and gold, of brass and lead, flowed out of the burning veins into hollow places of the earth that were proper for them. And when the metal grew hard, and men observed it looking beautifully and shining bright upon the ground, they were charmed with its gay and sparkling luster, and dug it up. And finding that it received the exact shape of the hollow molds in which it lay, they concluded, when it was melted by the heat, it would run into any form and figure they pleased, and they might draw it into a sharp point or a fine edge, and make themselves tools to cut down the woods, to smooth, to square, to plain timber, to pierce, to hollow, and to bore. These instruments they attempted to make of silver and gold, no less than by powerful blows to form the stronger brass, but in vain, for the soft quality of those metals gave way, and could not bear the force and violence of the stroke. And so brass was in most value, and gold was neglected as a blunt useless metal that would not hold an edge. But now brass is in no esteem, and gold succeeds in all its honors, and thus a chorus of flowing time changes the dignity of things. What was highly prized is now treated with contempt, and what was despised comes into its place, and is every day more eagerly pursued, is cried up with the greatest applause, and receives the respect and admiration of mankind. And now, my Memmius, you may easily of yourself perceive by what means the force of iron was discovered. The first weapons were hands, and nails, and teeth, and stones, and the broken boughs of trees, and then they learned to fight with fire and flame, and afterwards was the strength of iron and brass found out. But the use of brass was known before the benefit of iron was understood, for it was a metal more easy to work and in greater plenty. With brazen shares they plowed the ground, with arms of brass they carried on the rage of war, and dealt deep wounds about and seized upon their neighbors' cattle and their fields, for everything naked and unarmed was easily forced to give way. But the iron sword came gradually into use, and instruments of brass were laid aside with contempt. And now they began to plow with iron and with weapons of iron to engage in the doubtful events of war. And men first learned to mount the horse, with their left hand to manage the reins, and they fought with their right before they tried the dangers of war in a chariot drawn by two. They first used a chariot with a pair, and then they harnessed four, before they knew how to engage in chariots armed with scythes. 
The Carthaginians taught the Libyan elephants with their serpentine proboscis and the towers upon their backs to bear the smart of wounds and to disorder the embattled ranks of the enemy. And thus the rage of discord found out one art of slaughter after another as the dreadful scourges of mankind and increased the terrors of war every day. They tried the fury of bulls in their battles and drove boars against their cruel enemies. The Parthians placed roaring lions before their ranks with their armed keepers and fierce leaders to govern their rage and hold them in chains. In vain, for growing hot with the mixed blood they had tasted, they broke in their fury through the troops of friends and enemies without distinction, shaking their dreadful manes on every side. Nor could the horsemen cool their frightened horses, distracted with the roaring of the beasts, or turn them with reins against the foe. The lions with rage sprung out and threw their bodies every way and flew upon the faces that they met. Others they suddenly fell on behind and clasped with their paws and with sore wounds overcome, they flung them to the ground and held them down with their strong teeth and with their crooked claws. The bulls would toss the boars and crush them with their feet, and with their horns would gore the sides and bellies of the horses, and in their rage bear them to earth. The bears, with their strong teeth, destroyed their friends and cruelly stained the darts unbroken with their master's blood. The darts that broke upon themselves were stained with their own, and brought confused ruin upon man and horse, for though the horse, by leaping aside, would strive to fly the cruel biting of their teeth, or rearing up, pawed with their feet the yielding air, yet all in vain. You would see them, hamstrung by the beasts, fall down with their heavy weight which shake the ground. These creatures, therefore, that men saw were tame at home, now brought into the war grew mad with wounds, with noise, with flying, with terror and the tumult of the battle, nor could they by any means be brought back or cooled again, but every kind flew wildly over the plains, as when a bull, not rightly struck by the priest's sacrificing axe, breaks loose after much mischief done to all about him. These were the first arts of war. Yet I cannot believe but the first inventors must consider and foresee the common evils and sad calamities they must occasion. This, it is safer to say, was the case in general in some of all the worlds that were created in various manners, than to be particular and fix it upon one only. But they made use of beasts in their wars not so much from a hope of victory as to annoy and torment their enemies, being themselves sure to die because they distrusted their numbers and were unskilled in the use of arms. Don, thank you for reading that for us today. Martin's with us as well and would schedule to read today, but we had some technical difficulties, and so Don picked up the slack at the last minute. Today is interesting in terms of mostly devoted to the rise of warfare among early humans, but there's several interesting parts of it beyond that, and the best place to start is always at the beginning, and that's approximately line 1226, which talks about the admiral of a fleet surrounded by his legions being tossed about in a storm and praying to the gods for relief, but often in vain because he and his legions end up at the bottom of the ocean, or as Lucretia says, carried with all his devotion to the Stygian fairy. I'm not very good on that illusion, but I guess that's the fairy that carries you across to the underworld. Right, on the River Styx, yeah. River Styx, that would be the River Styx. And there's a ferryman at the River Styx, right? What's his name? Karen? There, yes, I think that's right. So the point there being that with such contempt, does some hidden power continually trample upon human greatness and treads with scorn upon the gaudy rods and cruel axes. Now, I'm interpreting that to mean the symbol of Roman power, which was the axes right. bound up between the rods, which I guess many of us know today as a, sort of a symbol of the Mussolini, I think, and they were using for a while. I don't know they continue to use that, but still a Roman symbol. Does that have a name? Um, Faces? That may be where fascism comes from. Is right, that right. The fascists, or F-A-S-C-E-S, is that bundle of sticks. I think I remember from my Latin class that, that that was supposed to mean something. Of course, it was the instruments by which they punished people, but do you know the symbolism of it, Don? Thanks to Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Bound bundle of wooden rods, sometimes including an axe with its blade emerging. The fascist is an Italian symbol that had its origins in Etruscan civilization, where it symbolized a magistrate's power and jurisdiction. 
The axe originally associated with the symbol as one of the oldest symbols of Greek civilization. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to let you figure out what the... Um, hmm, I didn't realize it was related to Greece, and I don't think I've ever realized that it was displayed without the axe. It always seems like the, yeah. you know, the axe is protruding from the rods. Oh, the symbolism of the fasces suggests strength through unity. A single rod is easily broken, while the bundle is very difficult to break. I haven't heard that, but that makes sense. So, yeah, so definitely uh, the symbol of, you know, power and bringing justice to society and all that sort of thing. So there's actually a, a, an extensive article on Wikipedia. So anybody who wants to look yeah. it up, and, uh, yeah, F-A-S-C-E-S. So these first two passages we have today, the, the, the second one ends the, this discussion, but it talks about that when the whole earth reels under our feet and the cities are shaken and tumble about us, why should we be surprised if men at such a time despise their own weak selves and ascribe infinite power and irresistible force to the gods by which they direct and govern the world? Now, that's one of the few times I think I've seen a specific reference to infinite power and irresistible force. That's a more modern concept of a god than I sometimes think that the Romans and Greeks had. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about last week, too, that it's a whole the whole idea that the the gods are in charge of the universe. And so whenever something is going wrong, that people look to these other powers to help them out of a jam and you know, to, that they they realized that they were they maybe had done something wrong themselves and were trying to propitiate the gods to bring things back into order because you see the admiral and the fleet you know praying to the gods to deliver him from the hurricane and the hurricane just sweeps him off the deck of the ship anyway so mm-hmm. it sh- I think I think what it shows at least to me is it shows the the tendency of people to look for that kind of of guidance and that kind of help and nature's complete and utter lack of any kind of you know supernatural power that's going to get you out of a hurricane basically so this sort of ends the uh discussion we were having last week on the gods this sort of puts a capstone on that sort of discussion is that the way you saw this section yeah that's the way i see that yes martin any thoughts so far Mm, not at this time no no, no, not for this one yet. Later on the metallurgy, I may have a comment. Absolutely. I th- was thinking about that when I was reading it, that this would be a good one to discuss whether you agreed with some of these comments here. I suppose if we were looking at some of the commentators, I bet we would find some discussion about how there's not a lot of transition here. It seems like he turns from this subject to the discovery of iron and use of He seems metals. to do a lot of he seems to do a lot of that bullet point kind of stuff. It's like, we're going to talk about this for a little bit, and yeah. now we're going to this. <laughs> yeah, these commentators may have some elaborate explanation, but why one section or the other might have been added in later or that kind of thing. But however that happened, this is the way we have it. And he turns the subject uh, on a dime, so to speak, to discussing the uh, development of metallurgy, as Martin just said. So this passage 1241 is a pretty long paragraph about how early people would have observed how metal can be molded and therefore that it might be useful in uh, the art of war. So yeah, I, I was curious to ask Martin about it. Is it is it a feasible sort of idea to think that forest fires could generate enough heat to make silver and gold and copper run out of the ground? <laughs> Or melt. I mean, if, if, if there is some gold, in, 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 that gold can be liquefied by the forest, uh, by fire, no? certainly. And uh, also gold is a noble metal. It, it will just stay shiny metal. But silver is, is easily tarnished. So you you need, really need to go into that mine to get the fresh rocks to, to see the silvery shine of the silver. And any of, of, of copper occasionally occurs as a pure metal as well, but more typically already as a mineral where you do no more see it as a metal. And iron for sure. Iron does not occur, uh, at least not anywhere where forest is. It would not occur in any elementary form. It will always be as a compound where it's no more recognizable as a metal. So that means this is highly uh, uh, speculative, what he says. Plus brass is a mixture. So uh, so, so even though a lot of metals occur together, so it might be by chance that they had approximately the right uh, mixture between copper and zinc or whatever else might might, uh, might there also be in addition. Uh, so so that's uh, by, by chance it was like that, but it's more likely that they, that, that they discovered it separately and then figured out how to how to improve the, the metal uh, by uh, mixing the, the the zinc and the copper. The first thing they discovered among this was not even that, but bronze. No? So they mixed the copper with tin 
and and that one is uh, then again more feasible because tin with a thin oxide layer uh, you can easily keep as a uh, uh, still as a metal recognized i mean in uh, in nature you will still find it as an ore where it doesn't does not look like metallic but uh, it's not too difficult to make then the tin plus it melts at very low uh, uh, te temperature com comparably so with again with a normal fire you can melt the tin uh, that's that's interesting, and, and I thought it, that with uh, the the translation we just read that he keeps using the word brass, and I just briefly looked in my in my low translation. According to them, the the Latin word that's used can actually either mean copper or bronze, and so it's interesting that that there's that sort of ambiguity there. But it, uh, it looks like that Loeb uses the translation of copper, and then some other translators have decided to use bronze. But the whole idea that it's it's an alloy between those two is is I think a, a an interesting point to make about that. It's not like you can find you know bronze out in out in nature. Mm -hmm. not and uh, the other thing is that people have also quite early produced artifacts just from copper. So that means it it was not not only bronze. Bronze was was probably the first metal or alloy then actually more uh, more precisely which which found widespread use. Huh? But I think at the same time they already knew also how how to use copper as a thing. But the 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 problem is with plain copper is that it's too soft. So uh, you know, of the applications they would want to use at that time, copper would uh, not be that good. But maybe for artifacts it would have been nice. So so that's why. Uh, and, and of course for for for, for type a type of utensils which can, which can afford to be soft, it w would still be okay. Uh, to 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 use copper because it's then then easier to to form ne? than uh, uh, other forms of metal. So copper and tin yes. are both uh, have low melting points. No, copper is actually a higher melting point, oh. but tin is a low melting point. And but what what was what, what both copper and tin have in common is that they're rather soft metal. And by mixing uh, uh, these soft metals with other metals, they become harder. Oh, okay. Martin, I could look this up on Wikipedia, but you could explain it better, just in case somebody who's listening doesn't know. I'd have to look it up myself. What is brass and alloy of? Of uh, normally of copper and zinc, but there can be other additions as well. As well. Okay. And what about bronze? What is bronze and alloy of? Yeah, yeah, bronze is more ambiguous. I mean, the original bronze is a copper and tin, but there can be other additions as well. Plus, uh, the term bronze has been applied to all kinds of, of mixtures with metals. Okay, so Monroe and Bailey here in our example are using the word copper, which is an element and which would presumably be an example of what you would find flowing on the ground if it were hot enough. I presume you wouldn't find either bronze or brass flowing on the ground because you, I don't guess either of those are naturally occurring, are they? Or are they? I mean, they're in an ore, so you need to, to get them in with a chemical reaction out of the ore. So that means you need to experiment a lot until you figure that out. That out, and in copper, in most cases, you will need to do the same. So, so it's gold you you can really uh, get uh, out of some mixture. If you heat it up, then the gold flow will flow out. Yeah. So it seems to me that Lucretia seems to know a little bit about how they were making bronze implements and how they would melt gold, and was sort of extrapolating backwards. But from what Martin's been saying here, it sounds like that Lucretius's ideas of how the forest fires would do gold and silver and copper and and those sorts of things that 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 is that's not the way it really could have happened because it's just it just doesn't naturally occur that way yeah mm -hmm. so, so that's what that i would expect yeah. so uh, and uh, and of course this is, uh, these these covers happened long before there were things written down about this yeah. so right. that means it's very unlikely that there is there was some chain of stories back to those who originally discovered it. Exactly. I think that, yeah, I think that's a good point, that there was sort of a, a traditional way of like, where here's where bronze came from. I guess he's probably very reasonable in presuming that however the sequence occurred, people found that certain metals or alloys were softer than others and that they needed to go for things that were harder if they're going to make successful use of the instruments that they make out of them. Exactly. And I think that that makes sense because he, what he's doing is generally laying out the, the history of different metals being being used in in cultures and that sort of thing and so he didn't get the details right again but the general idea of that they would have wanted to have harder metals first and so that the uh, the bronze would have been very popular and then once they found out that they could make 
you know, shiny things out of gold, then that seems to have supplanted the 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 utility the utility seems to be overshadowed by the shininess of the gold basically yeah now i suspect that this is a long paragraph we've just been reading i suspect that he was at least as interested in the final couple of sentences as he was in that history part because i think he is making an alloy here that results in a philosophical conclusion that's pretty important to him about how gold succeeded to the honor of being more valuable even though gold is not useful for these instruments of war or boring or anything else and he says and thus a course of flowing time changes the dignity of things what was highly prized is now treated with contempt and what was despised comes into its place and is every day more eagerly pursued and is cried up with the greatest applause and receives the respect and admiration of mankind so I see that as a very important philosophic reflection of the point he's made several times throughout the poem, that this is basically an event, basically a circumstance, and the value of something comes from the circumstance and is not intrinsic to the thing itself. And so it also seems to me to echo what he was talking about, that originally beauty and strength were yes. valued. And now, you know, gold and things were valued over that, over the natural occurring attributes of things. And again, here, the natural attributes of iron implements or, or bronze instruments were that they could they could cut and they could be used in war and they could be used in agriculture. But then people found out about gold and now gold has supplanted the utility of the other metals in their in people's estimation. This is a principle of wide application, and I see this as one of the really key aspects of Epicurean philosophy, that there's nothing inherently good or desirable or evil or an undesirable in something. It's all a matter of the context and the times in which it is arising. And if you think that something has an absolute value to it other than pleasure, then you've really got a problem to sort out with an Epicurean philosophy, because I think we come to the conclusion conclusion very clearly throughout all of his reasoning that ultimately in human life, it is pleasure that is valuable to us. And if it's not something that is a function of pleasure, even the tool itself is not inherently valuable. The value of the tool is only in that it produces pleasure or relieves us of pain, which is essentially the same calculation in Epicurean philosophy. And what he's basically taken there is, is that it seems to me that whenever they found these metals and they could use them for different purposes, that it, it there was a uh, it was sort of almost like a labor saving device that, you know, before even in warfare, they had to use their nails and hands and the boughs of trees. And then whenever they found this, then, oh, hey, it's easier to kill people now. So that's a uh, that was a you know not not necessarily a, a good thing for society, but at least they saw it as a way that they could save time and save energy. Right. These, these metals are a means to the end. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I was and, trying to say in a roundabout way. Yeah, means to the end and not the end in itself. How right. many times we come back to that issue of whether something virtue is virtue its own reward or is virtue there because it brings pleasure? Many, many aspects of things come back to that question. Okay, maybe we should move on. Um, in 1281, he talks about that Mimius can now by himself understand how the force of iron was discovered and supplanted the use of brass, which is another example, I guess, of the changing circumstances. And he uses that observation to introduce the issue of how they began to plow with iron and with weapons of iron to engage in the doubtful events of war. And so now we turn to a long section of the development of war. The use of various animals. They, they, <laughs> he pulled out all the stops there with that. Yes, a lot of detailed explanation of why boars and bulls. Bulls and lions and yeah, lions bears, have, oh have, my. They have a problem with realizing who their friends and enemies are, apparently. Part of what caught my eye there was the part about how they were in their rage confused. These creatures, therefore, that men saw as being tame at home, being brought into the war, grew mad with their wounds and with the noise and with the terror and the tumult of the battle. And even after that, they could not be cooled down again, but they flew wildly over the plain. So there's maybe maybe an aspect of that same observation about how 
an animal that seemed tame enough under normal circumstances in the middle of a war became just as much your enemy as as he was a tool to attack the other. Now, other than that, I mean, these detailed descriptions that it looks almost like it must have been inspiration for the Lord of the Rings stories, where they're, where they're also... <laughs> Yeah. He's fighting them. Yeah, yeah. I guess, let's see, he does talk about the elephants, I guess. So he's got elephants and lions and bulls, and of course he's talking about horses pretty regularly through here. And I think there's boar, yeah, boars in there. I don't know whether he got the idea from an actual battle or whether it was possibly seeing some, because I... If I remember correctly, the, the whole idea of fighting animals in, in the Colosseum and the arenas were a regular occurrence in, in Rome as well. So he could possibly have seen people fighting animals and just seeing how they reacted in, in those situations as well and just sort of extrapolated that they might have used these in battle at some point. Well, what, what I read about, uh, animals which actually have been used in battle, except for, uh, in addition to horses, have been for, for some people the elephants, then uh, dogs, no? But mm, uh, not so much uh, these other animals you mentioned, like lions and bears. Those would be really, or, or bulls, I think those would be rather impractical to use in battles. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, interestingly enough, from the from the Loeb translation that I have, the note for lines 1341 to 49 says, lines 1341 to 49 confirm that Lucretius did not invent the story of the experiments with wild animals, but derived it from an Epicurean or historical source. Okay. Mm-hmm. How does that confirm it? I, the, yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out as well i guess his sentence the, the sentence that the lobe starts out is is if it really was true that they did it oh. is the um so he's he's sort of positing that you know if it you know it, it sounds like that he read something and he said if it really was true that they did it you know then here's what okay yes that would make sense that that, that would tell you that he's looking at some other source he's looking at some other source and mm-hmm. saying well if, if this is really true yeah now maybe this for most of the threat experiment so what was really what was consistently used over periods of time for some people were then horses, elephants, and dogs, right. and not the other stuff. You know, I'm disappointed that he doesn't mention here the dogs that you're bringing up, Martin, because, of course, I've got in my mind the Gladiator movie where the big scene, maybe in one of the forests in Germany or something, where there's a big battle scene. and I am. The, the leader in Gladiator has a, a German shepherd that he's is following him around through the battle. But you're right. I would think dogs among all would be the yeah. most successful uh, animals because they'd be more intelligent and would be able to better determine who their friends and foe were. At least they'd know yeah, their masters, I would think. The German shepherd as a breed is about 100 years old. So that one... <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know the scene of or what i'm talking about martin i can't remember the name of the actor or the battle he's supposed to be in or anything i guess oh yeah it was yeah it was like the one that started the movie out right yeah, yeah. i always root for the germans in that one those are my <laughs> <laughs> It's an interesting scene, though, just to see how the Roman lines were organized and see them. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that scene, Mark? That's not certainly, I don't know why I want to say Tudorburg Forest or something. The, 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 that battle was much later than the, yeah. the one where the yeah. were defeated. So the one that depicted there was the actual victorious one, and that was more, that must have been in, in near Vienna or somewhere like that, no? So mm-hmm. where the, the Romans actually won. I mean, this was, if I'm, if I'm not mixing this up, this was then the story about Marc- Marcus yes. Aurelius and yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and Marcus Aurelius was challenged two times by uprisings by the, the, this uh, most powerful Germanic tribe at that time, uh, which lived around uh, the, the predecessor of today's Austrians. No? And, and he defeated them twice, both in his youth and one when he was already old. And on the way back from the victory, that's when he died of typhus. Okay. Uh, yeah, Teutoburg was whenever the... Romans got their butts handed to them, so mm-hmm. that was yeah, that, that was, was er, earlier, right? Yeah, that, that was uh, I think nine uh, after uh, uh, Christ. That was uh, when Varus was uh, the commander of the three legions who got lost then. In, in, yeah, uh, and uh, it's actually the Teutoburg Forest. It, it's still not uh, fully clear. It, when it was somewhere, probably not far from that area, but uh, they, they haven't found. I mean, they found a couple of battle scenes, e- even one which is not recorded at all near the Harz Mountains. But but uh, from what they're finding, it's clear there was there, there was a fairly big uh, Roman army apparently defeated. You know, so that time frame was not all that long after Lucretius. If Lucretius was maybe 50 BC, the emperor of Rome during that 
battle we're talking about was Augustus, right? Uh, Mar- yes, 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 yes. It, it should still be. No, 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 no nonsense. Uh, Augustus was 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 dead at that time already. They were saying, yeah. Now I got the timeline wrong. But, when was Tiberius? Well, so it should be. I love the way you say that. Like we just know that off the top of our head. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking. I, I, I was thinking, Martin, that there, there was a famous uh, history about that battle where the emperor and I thought it was Augustus said, "Varus, bring me back my legions" or something like that. You're right. But, but I thought it was the. You're right. Yes, that, that matches. I think then uh, Augustus died 14 uh, after uh, Christ, no. And that would be five years after that battle. And then uh, his, his adoptive son, or, or Tiberius, he was then from 14 to 37. Okay, so this was really very close to Lucretius's time frame. Uh, and then Marcus Aurelius was 100 years or so later, right? Uh, 100, around 180 was that. I think when he died, it was 180, and then Commodus took over. So almost 200 years later then, okay, after Lucretius's time. Okay, that's kind of an excursion into Roman history there. And I'll make one more excursion. Over the years, I would get Lucan and Lucretius confused. And so at some point, I've read the Lucan poem, Pharsalia. There's there's Lucan, there's Lucian, and Lucretius, right? Am I I right? Right. That's right. That's right. Lucian is our very Epicurean satirist. Right. And who we talk about a lot. Lucan, as far as I remember, doesn't have that much reference to Epicurean philosophy. The only reason I mention him now is because Pharsalia being that a battle of about that time period, of course, when Lucretius was alive. But what I just remember from Pharsalia is how it has it just has paragraph after paragraph of all this extensive, gory battle scene stuff, a lot like this paragraph 1308 we're talking about here. And I guess Lucan came after, well, gosh, that would be about <laughs> the same time period, too. We're, we're, we're on too much of a tangent on Roman timelines today. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, so just to bring this back to the yes, poem. Yes, bring us back. Um, um, I thought it was interesting here, just in, in the translation that we read, that he said, these were the first arts of war after he talked about all the animals and stuff. Yet I cannot believe, but the first inventors must consider and foresee the common evils and sad calamities they must occasion. But I think that it's interesting that it's safe to say what it was the case in general in some of all the worlds that were created in various manners than to be yes. particular and fix it upon one only, which I think is a really interesting alternative universe sort of perspective that just I – Came came about completely unexpected whenever I read this. I was like, because he's he's basically talking, you know, alternative history, alternative well, universe ideas here. That it might have happened over here, it might have happened over here. Right, right. Not alternative universe in the sense of different dimensions or alternatives right. of this world, but an observation that relates back to his earlier observation about how the universe itself is populated with basically unlimited numbers of right. other planets that have life on them. So if it could um, happen, it probably did happen somewhere. Yeah. Th- that that would definitely be a sentence. Let's let's look at some of the other translations of that sentence just to be sure that we're not putting too much uh, emphasis exactly. on it. I noted before we started the podcast today that it, that particular phrase does not appear to be in the Monroe version that I have transcribed, and I'm not quite sure why that would be, yeah. but it, it is in Bailey, and of course it's in Loeb, uh, which and means I, that. And I thought that has, I thought the Stallings has an interesting take on it as well. The way that she does it is that the calamitous debacle they thus called down on the head of one and all it's easier to imagine that instead this happened somewhere in the universe among the many worlds constructed in various ways rather than in any one particular earth you fancy oh boy that is a very close approximation of the bailey version there so yes she does the poetic interpretation Mm -hmm. but i have bailey in front of me it says and you could more readily maintain that this was done somewhere in the universe in the diverse worlds fashioned in diverse fashion than on any one determined earth. Yep. It was very close to that. And and Martin Ferguson Smith has, I must confess that I find it almost incredible that they were unable to anticipate and imagine the consequences of their action before the dreadful common disaster occurred. And it would be easier to maintain that it happened somewhere in the universe of various worlds variously formed than to assign it to any one specific earth. Interesting, yeah, because the Latin has uh, in various mundis for the various worlds, and then uno terrarum of one earth. In the uh, so they are talking about the various worlds, and then it, instead of you know, one earth, as you uh, mentioned there. 
of course, the the Loeb edition is basically, I mean, Martin Ferguson Smith's most recent edition is a variation, I guess, of his work that he started on the Loeb version. And I think he sometimes tends to, as the more time passes by, he kind of realizes something new about what it may mean, and he uses slightly different words. Mm -hmm. And and this might be a good example. I particularly agree with kind of the way he's translated this one. I like the fact that he's like, you know, surely they could have thought that, you know, bears are not going to work in battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the way that he's wording that. I'm glad you said that because I was getting confused about what he was talking about in terms of what they were unable to anticipate. I, th- I was yeah. kind of thinking that he was just talking about the horrors of war in general. But I believe I, you're I believe you're right. He's talking about the use of animals. Yeah. I mean, could, couldn't you think that, you know, they're just going to like they're they're not going to like follow the lions and bears are not going to be following the lead of their trainers in the middle of battle so I mean, couldn't you couldn't you have thought of this yeah that's exactly right and in fact if you go back to the beginning of that passage he says but did people really make this experiment and mm-hmm. to me, that makes it clear what he's saying. I don't know whether that is a. It almost it almost strikes me as like a line from Herodotus, where where he'll talk about a, a particular story from a particular area of the world, and he's like, you know, well, some people are telling me this, but uh, I'm just going to tell you the story, and you can decide whether you believe it yourself or not. Yeah, reading Martin Ferguson Smith's version of paragraph 1340 just kind of puts a whole different spin on it for me, because the way Martin Ferguson Smith writes it, it's clear that the whole passage is really basically a statement that Lucretius is saying that he finds it hard to believe that they really ever experimented with animals like that because they should have foreseen what would happen and it would be easier to believe that people on some other planet did it than to assign it to to this earth and then certainly the experiment must have been inspired not so much by hope of victory but it's by a desire to give the enemy cause for sorrow even at the cost of self-destruction Exactly. In a, situ- in a situation involving people who distrusted their numbers and were short of arms. Right. So there, he's almost saying that it was it was a desperate measure to try and win a mm-hmm. battle because mm-hmm. they were either outnumbered or didn't have enough weapons. And well, yeah, let's let's let some wild animals loose and see what happens. And Stallings does the same thing with hedging, hedging his bets, too, because her first line in that paragraph of uh, 1341 is if people ever actually tried such things with an exclamation point at the end. and then, But as for me, I find it difficult to think that they could not foresee the calamitous debacle. <laughs> yeah, this is an example to me of how useful it is to read multiple translations at the same time mm-hmm. whenever there's any confusion about what's being discussed. Yeah, you know, I think it's fascinating that he you know, talks about these sorts of things, but, it, it, but it's obviously, you know, here's here's what could have happened. He's not necessarily, this is what happened, but this is, you know, this is, this is, basically what I've heard. Oh, and even the Latin in the lobe seems to be that that first about, you know, if it, if it really happened is basically its own sentence. So it is set off from the rest of the paragraph. So if I remember, C is if, so C fuit ut facerent. So if this actually happened. So he's definitely hedging his bets. He's reporting, but it's like, uh, well, maybe not. Let me read the Martin Ferguson Smith footnote to 1341. He says, Lucretius sensibly finds it hard to believe that people could have been so foolish as to fail to foresee the disastrous consequences of their experiment. In an infinite universe containing an infinite number of worlds, there are an infinite number of chances, and such an event might have occurred sometime somewhere, but if so, only in a situation where people were desperate and wanted to sell their lives as dearly as possible. So I'll buy that. Yeah. 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 I think that's a pretty good summary of that yeah. uh, last passage. Of course, the part that interests me, being always ready to take something off in a direction of Star Trek, is, is this discussion, like you said, of the infinite worlds and how it might have happened somewhere else. So it's interesting to me that just in passing, he can throw that kind of a reference in without exactly. really considering it to be particularly controversial. As within the Epicurean context, it's just a natural observation to observe that something like this could be going on throughout the universe. That is definitely one of the things that fascinates me about the philosophy as a whole, that you have somebody from, you know, 100, 200 BC, if we were with Epicurus himself, and then working the whole way up through Lucretius, that they can just throw those things out. It's like, oh yeah, there's ultimate world, there's an infinite number of worlds, and you know, this could be happening somewhere in the universe, and it's, it just sounds such like such a modern way of thinking to me. It just it, it it's one of the things that struck me right from the very beginning and reading some of the things from Epicurus and, and Lucretius and it just 
astounded me. You know, one other word that appears a couple times in the text today, Lucanian, Lucanian oxen. That's obviously not a reference to Lucan, the poet. Is that a reference to a location? I don't know that this is... I would assume so. Lucania is a uh, region of southern Italy. So evidently, evidently, maybe they were renowned for their oxen down there. (laughs) Well, glancing ahead, I see that we're going to sort of have a similar presentation next week talking about progression of planting and potentially uh, clothing as well. But we can, of course, come back and deal with that next week. We're probably at the end of a normal time frame today. So let's talk about whether anybody has any summary thoughts on today and as as always, it's best to start with Martin. Well, I have nothing else to add. All right. Don, anything from you that we haven't covered or just nope, a summary? I think, I think we had a nice little discussion on that last paragraph there. That was that was an interesting uh, way to end, I believe. Right. I, I see exactly the same thing. Okay. Well, maybe that's a good place for us to stop, and we'll come back in a week and go further from there. So thanks, everybody, and we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. Have a good weekend. Okay. Right. Thanks. Bye.